Hey there lovely people, Jonathan Mark Mendes Painted Love and welcome to my channel. For today's project I'm working on a small bedside cabinet. Now although this is a small project it's going to be jam-packed full of information from woodwork to foam marbling and a very brand new technique from me. It's an age-old technique that I'm kind of making it work in a Jonathan kind of way, um, using many familiar products that you all know and love that I use. So let's take a closer look at the actual project. I'm just going to take a little moment to talk a bit about the piece of furniture that I'm working on today. Now, I do believe this is probably 1920s, 1930s. I think it might be an apprentice piece or it's a marriage. The legs kind of don't feel right. Um, it has a flat base, which alludes to probably these legs not being original. Um, it could have been a maybe a humidor or something like that. I'm not quite sure, but it does all feel kind of out of proportion. Although that's what drew me to this piece of furniture, the shape, it's so tall. And, and when I'm saying about out of proportion, now if this was a bedside table with these long legs, it would probably end about here with a top on it, but we've got this extra piece. That is all one thing which is kind of making me think that this probably was two halves, just two separate things. The legs weren't with this piece originally. Maybe I'm wrong, somebody might correct me there. Um, but nevertheless, it was cheap, it was unloved, nobody was buying it until I got there. So I'm gonna change it into something that I truly love. I'm gonna point out a couple of the things that I don't like about it. Up here, the sides where this top meets, it kind of goes in. This, the top section is smaller than the outside edges. I'm not keen on that. That's something that I want to address throughout the tutorial. The other thing is this. I'm not keen on this. It's got a mirror at the back and a mirror on here. I don't like this flap down. Now, I had considered kind of panelling out this area so it looked more like a drawer to match in with that. But I think that I'm going to lose this top section, this completely and add some sort of delicate, intricate um, work to the top section to try and create a, an open cubby and keep the cupboard. Maybe adding some sort of pattern or trim or some decorative work to the front. Um, and I think we're gonna go for a marble top. So leave it with me. Like I said, it's gonna be one of those tutorials where I'm just gonna, I'm gonna strip the things down that I don't want and kind of rebuild it in the shape that I want to. I want to proportion this top section out with the, the legs. So wish me luck, guys. So far so good. I'm really liking the opening. It seems to work for me. Obviously I'm waiting for the two pack um, filler to harden so that I can sand this smooth to make the hinge where the hinge were rebated to make them vanish. I've also turned my attention to the handle. I've removed the handle. Now this was the handle that was on the cupboard front. Now I would say this is Bakelite. It's 1930s. Definitely not right for this piece of furniture. 
So I've popped the screw in to receive this. I found this in my um, handles drawer. I kind of think that's kind of a little bit more French inspired, French country inspired. So that will go there. The screw's ready to take that. Um, the top run. Now I've been thinking about this long and hard. How do I build this out? Obviously I'm gonna put a new top on the top to kind of make it overhang a little bit more. But I want to kind of hide the, the funny little connection. So I've got some trim that I'm going to use over the top just to kind of, it marries in with the bottom half a little bit. So we're going to build that out and then the new top will sit over the top. So I'm going to start working on measuring and cutting out with a 45 degree angle on the corners with my um, chop saw so I can get a nice clean connection all the way around. Right, I'm going to apply the trim to the edge. All I'm going to do is use quick and thick. This is quick and thick tight bond. I use this quite a lot for wood you bend trims and it's really good. It dries quickly um, to a really good adhesion. Just spreading out only a little bit of glue. I am going to um, hold this in place with some tacks. There's the trim. Also, I've got the um, front trim with me and I'm going to offer that up because if you tack this down and you don't get a neat connection here, it'll be in the wrong place. So I'm going to start with the tacking through just two places and then go back to offering it up just to check that it's in the right place. I've got really, really thin panel pins, really thin. Um, I'm going to pop one in here. Go back it's kind of mostly through the wood that's the right one it feels good in fact I'm going to hold into place just there for now right that's it. got it just to save me from damaging the wood. It doesn't have to be perfect, guys. This will have lots of paint over the top. Check that I got that in the right place. Yeah, nice and snug. We can go with the second pin at the other end. A little bit easier this time.
we have it. A nice balanced out top, ready to receive the brand new top that we're gonna make. But on top of all of this, I'm gonna use a piece of scrap MDF. It is gonna be a marble technique. So I'm gonna keep it quite simple. I'm gonna go with the clean lines of this. I could have gone for a more fluted edge, but I kind of think this is a little bit square in its proportions. So we're gonna go for a neat, um, routed out piece of MDF for the top. And then we're gonna think about adding some sort of detail to the edges of this aperture. So I'm looking for, again, balance. I want to kind of marry this in from top to bottom. Um, the piece of wood, actually, the MDF wood, is probably the right width from back to front. So all I've got to work out is the, the depth that I want hanging over and make one straight cut to this piece of wood. So let's get stuck in. So my MDF is all cut to size. Um, because I know that I'm gonna be going for a marble finish, I don't want to go with this just chunky straight edge. So I've got my router out. I'm gonna take off an edge, just make a little curved edge with a little indentation in there, just to give it more of an illusion. Most marbles are honed on the edge. They've got beautiful edges so that's what I'm going to attempt to do just take all the edges off here and then we're going to sand and prepare for the marble later. Here we have it. I'm super pleased with the routering. What I have actually done, you may saw that in the last speeded up clip, is I've softened the edges. Can you see how that routering is not as sharp? I've softened all of the edges on that sharp edge because what happens to marble over the years, it gets worn away and these edges would naturally do that as marble. So it's all about creating an illusion, this is MDF that's gonna to appear to be marble. Let's place it on top and look at the balance. It's not quite level. There we go, somewhere like that. Now, once this is painted out underneath, and this is marble, you can see where I'm aiming. We've got um, a balance between the legs, the knee of the leg sticking out. There's a real good bit of balance. I want to address what we're gonna do in here. I've promised that I would do a, some sort of little detail and here's what I'm going to do it with. This is off an old chair back. Now I save everything. The chair obviously had seen better days and it was 
you know, poorly, but I kept all of the spindles that came with it because these things are so useful to keep in the workshop. And I'm looking at the design of this. Can you see here, there's a lovely swirly kicky out bit there. And there's also one there. So I'm thinking if I can split this down the middle, both ends, I haven't decided which end I'm gonna use, but then I could use, take that top bit off, I could use this proportion, half of that, to go somewhere in there to create a lovely aperture each side, or the other way around, haven't decided yet, we're gonna cut them out and decide that way around on that end and that end, or the other way, we could cut out this little, it looks a little bit like a fish, um, and use that in the corner, maybe have an opening in the corner. I haven't worked it out yet. So let's cut this, the last bit of the woodwork. Once we know what we've got to go with, we can start sanding out and preparing for paint. So I've been having a little play around with my cutouts and the uh, this one initially I thought would go like that and then we'd cut off another little piece on the corner so it would do that and that on each corner which is quite nice but I feel it's a little bit chunky and heavy. The um, other pieces that I came up with was these two pieces split in two um, from the middle of the chair. I think this is going to work much better and initially again I thought I would go up into this corner and use that and maybe cut off somewhere here and do exactly the same thing on the other side, just here, Mr. M's walking in with a cup of tea. Thank you very much. Um, and then I've changed my mind. I'm gonna go with the long ways. I think long ways could be really interesting because this is such a long piece of furniture. It's kind of elegant and uplifting almost. Um, I'm gonna go there and there and it's kind of giving sort of a theatre effect, like curtains at each side. Lots of French furniture do have spindles and things at the top like this. So that's where they're gonna go. Gonna move on to sanding the filler ready for paintwork. And I've just come up with one more thing that's quite exciting. I am gonna add an embellishment. Originally, I was gonna leave this and keep it quite plain, but I'm gonna go with a wood you bend molding, which I absolutely love and it's been waiting for a piece of furniture for such a long time. So we're gonna pop a wood you bend molding in the center of this cupboard. So let's get these on. So I'm super pleased with how the chair back, these little corbels have worked out. I really, really love them. They look awesome with the piece. Um, I'm gonna explain a couple of things where I'm going next. I might jump all over the place with this because my mind's kind of jumping all over. I am gonna add a would you bend molding to the front of this. I wasn't gonna do that. I was just gonna go with a straight paint finish with these little extra pieces, 
the marble top and call it done. Um, the paint effect that I'm gonna be using kind of needs this brown finish, this shiny brown finish. Now, obviously the trim underneath here and the little corbels either side, they don't have a dark brown finish. So the answer for that is a gel stain, which unfortunately for me, I don't have any in my workshop. If anybody wants to send me some gel stain, I'll take it. Um, but raw wood, would, uh, for this technique, you would need a gel stain, really. And as for the wood you bend, which come a little bit like this, gel stain for the wood you bends. Now, I've had to rummage around in the back of my paint cupboard to find something that would stain this. I really needed something to stain it. I did this last night because the only um, top coat that I had that wasn't water-based was um, Yacht Varnish, which takes a long time to dry. So I'm gonna show you the Would You Bend. Here it is. And this is the one I'm gonna use. I've absolutely wanted to use this for such a long time. So you can see now, this is gonna sit kind of in the center of that door. And it's pretty much close to this kind of dark brown finish. So that's where that's gonna go. Now, what am I gonna do with these? I can't do that in the time that I've got today whilst filming this. So I'm gonna address this with um, a little bit of fusion coal black um, just to make them a little bit darker. The trim underneath as well, we'll lose that. I'm gonna do the trim. I'm not gonna be doing too much distressing on these areas. I'm gonna just risk it for a biscuit and hope that the coal black underneath will react a little bit like the stain. So let's get a little bit of coal black on here and we can really see how these bed in. I'm going to apply my wood you bend moulding to the front of the aperture of the door. There's just one thing that I want to do prior to sticking this down. This is one of two halves. The code number for this one is um, 1457. That's the packaging. Um, it comes like that, comes back and front on the packaging. But with this not being one full, it joins together here with this bow. Now, I'm not too keen on how that connects, so I'm just gonna take a thin little sliver off each one so I can marry them up a little bit closer. So let's get stuck in with some heat. So we're going to address the prep work of the marble on the MDF wood. I'm super happy with this. It's really taking shape. So as I said before, um, MDF is really porous, especially the end grain after we've sanded it. So all I'm going to do with this is take a little bit of the quick and thick, only a small amount. I'm going to pop it into a little, this is a yogurt pot and add some water to loosen that down about 50 50 there's a bit of water in there 
kind of loosen this down so it, it flows freely and it should just seal off the end grain of the um, the MDF because when I hit it with, I, I am using chalk paint, but sometimes even chalk paint is sucked in by um, really porous surfaces. So it's just to help before we move on to the, um, the marble technique. So that's what we've got, kind of a, a drippy, runny version of the glue. And let's pop some on. So all I'm gonna do is just literally add it to, I might do two coats to the end. It'll just kind of soak in and allow it to, especially where we've sanded over the edges here. I've sanded over that edge. And it should help with our base coat of chalk paint, ready to do our marble technique. The top part is really good because that has like a manufacturing finish. So if it's new MDF, you would um, most definitely. And of course, there's nothing stopping you from doing this section if you're gonna do something like this with real wood. Long as it's a really smooth finish, you have to sand away quite well. Um, I've done it over many pieces of furniture um, as is, but it was just the fact that this top needed a new one to kind of balance. So um, you can do it over any substrate, even melamine. It works really well over melamine. As long as you get the, the steps of the process of my marble technique um, the right way, then you shouldn't have any issues. Now it's time to start the prep work for the marble top. Now I have many tutorials on how to do this over on my channel. Um, but I'm going to talk you through step by step here just on fast play. So first up I'm going to give the board of wood a coat of white paint. In this case I've only had to give it one coat of paint because it's MDF and it's quite porous and it's just gone on so beautifully. If it was a piece of dark wood then you probably would need to give it two, two and a half coats. As you can see here, I'm lightly sanding to get a really smooth finish. Then next up, we're gonna use a clear wax to seal down the paintwork. I'm just giving it one full coat and really buffing the surface to burnish the wax into the surface. Now I'm gonna add another coat of white chalk paint. This is old white chalk paint over the top of the wax surface and this will bring it to the point where we can start working on the marble technique. You will need to make sure that your surface is dry before you start working the marble technique. I know that might sound strange when we're going to be adding more water to the surface of the tabletop to create the marble look. Also, I'm watering down my graphite paint just a little bit, just to loosen the paint. And here you go, you can see me applying another mist coat of water. I'm just blotting um, the excess water away and then taking a cloth and my brush to create the veining and just stamping down with the clean cloth and a damp cloth. I'm alternating between the two and I've got a really long bristle brush. This is a synthetic brush, which I'm using any what way just to blend away those lovely veins. Just a subtle version of marble here. I'm not going too far over the top with this. If you would like to see more marbling, there is other tutorials over on the channel.
Okay guys, so this is the marble complete. At this stage, you would wax this with clear wax and polish to a nice, buff it up to a nice sheen, and that would be it. Um, it is still a little bit damp. I've just spritzed it, spritzed it again. I wanna give you, it's a very subtle marble. That's all I wanted, but I've just come up with a concept that I might regret. So you're gonna join me on a first. Um, because it's so sheer and perfect, I want to create, sometimes marble gets um, discoloration for whatever reason, it's a porous material. Sometimes things might have been left on here and it will have soaked in. So if this goes wrong, I'm doing the marble all over again, but it will be off camera. I am taking some, can you see, coffee granules. I'm gonna use these to make a couple of little areas where it looks slightly um, dirty with coffee granules. So how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna take my spritz with the coffee granules, I'm gonna add plenty of water in there and let these dissolve. I've got a little brush here. I'm gonna use this because coffee is a really lovely way of staining many things. It, it's ki kind of high in pigment and it's got that warmth to it, which I really like. So, fingers crossed, let's incorporate all that really well. Fingers crossed this will work. So this is my front half of my cabinet here and I've got this dead white space here. So I'm gonna start somewhere in here with this coffee granules. Look, there's the liquid. Um, and all I'm gonna do is just take a little bit on this brush and just drop it on. There is a little bit of water on here and make sort of a little circle. The odd little bit of, of a blemish here and there. It's scary guys, wish me luck. And I'm gonna mist in and allow it just to sit in there. It's quite strong of a color, but I think by the time it dries, it should be quite nice. Go in the center. My table isn't flat, so I'm just gonna lift this up. That's it. I'm tinkering around with it, really. Maybe a little bit over here. It's just a couple of places where I kind of think, yeah. I'm gonna hit it with a cloth, a dry cloth, I think. This has got all sorts of stuff on it, so I'm going to ball that up. It's the smallest of details, but I think it will make a big difference. That little bit of warmth in there, just to kind of make it look a little bit more aged. It's not for everybody. Most people would want it clean, but I quite like these little anomalies that make it look sort of old. It's gonna be heavy on this corner now, I'm getting brave. Remove it from the crevice. Oh, lovely. A little bit on the front edge. Yeah, that's nice. I hope you can see on camera, it's just a slight colour change, which I kind of think helps the age of this piece. Maybe a little bit more up here. I'm gonna go heavy. Now I've got brave. Sometimes old pieces of marble just have those gorgeous little stains. That looks a bit too full on, that's it. Just that little bit of warmth. And 
deep rooted in. Going back over, just on the odd bit, offload. Allow it to sit a little while, see what it's gonna do. Soften the edges a little bit. It's new to me, guys. It's new to you as well. Coffee ingress. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna let it dry, see what I think. If it's terrible, we'll refigure it. If not, it's gonna get waxed ready for the top, the bottom half of the cabinet. But that's where we're gonna move on to now, the paintwork of that. Looking forward to another new technique from me. It's an old technique that I've recycled an age-old technique which I'm going to use in a modern kind of a way. Okay guys, now time for the fun part. We're going to refinish the outside of the actual carcass of this piece of furniture. I hope you're still with me. I know there's been lots of technical stuff with the restructuring of this piece of furniture. We are gonna go for a aged old chippy look and how I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna create a gesso. Now, if you don't know what a gesso is, it's an age old um, primer, it's used on canvases, it's used on furniture and many other items. I even know that my husband, when he was a little kid, he remembers uh, buying with his family a big block of gesso and um, grinding it all down and painting the exterior of the house. It's kind of a primer coat. Now, you can buy gesso, but I'm gonna do it with one of my favorite products, um, Salt Wash. Um, this is a product that I've been a, a fan of for such a long time, and I don't believe that this has probably even been done before. Maybe I'm wrong. Somebody out there, if you've used um, this as a gesso, let me know. Um, so we're gonna create a wash of gesso with Salt Wash. Uh, and I'm just gonna basically, if I can get the lid off, we're gonna add some salt wash. I'm going to take the little cup out. We're going to need quite a lot here, guys. We're going to pop some um, salt wash into the container. I'm going to put quite a lot in because I know that I'm going to need a lot. And I'm going to probably mix it equal parts with just water. Um, we want kind of a batter consistency. I'm going to just do this. I'll know, I mean, that's not where we want it, thick and gloopy, a little bit more water. It needs to be quite like a paint consistency, not as thick as chalk paint, but somewhere in the middle. Make sure you get it all mixed. It will clog to the sides of the um, container. So give it a good old mix. I think maybe a little bit more salt wash and then we're going to start priming the whole exterior of the piece.
as you will have seen, I've given the whole piece one coat of gesso, and then the leftovers, I went back with another half pass. Whilst I'm waiting for this to dry, and it must be dry before moving on to the next part of the process, I'm taking the time to paint the cubby with Annie Sloan Cocoa. What a fabulous colour. So here's a little close up of how the half pass of gesso looks. It's kind of patchy, bobbly, grainy, a little bit salt washy textured. That is exactly how it should look. And we're gonna move on to removing some of the gesso, kind of creating some anomalies ready for the top coat of paint. How we're gonna remove some of this gesso is we're gonna use a damp cloth. Now I've got a microfiber cloth. You want something that's really not very scratchy. This is super, super soft. You could use a natural sponge. Um, I don't know whether they're allowed to harvest natural sponge anymore. So I tend to go with things that I can wash and reuse over and again. And microfiber is really lovely to do this. And we're just going to add, we're going to scrunch up the cloth and add some water to the surface. Um, each time offloading a little bit of the water, I'm going to take it really steady. I'm just going to blot the um, different areas, just adding some water. And eventually what you'll see, if I do the detailed areas, you'll see some of the, um, some of it come off like here. It's just gonna erase some of it on the edges. Oh, looky guys, look. The uh, Fusion Mineral Paint worked. It will go back to almost translucent as well. Don't panic, as it dries back out, it will go back to almost white again. But really, all you're gonna do is wet distress certain areas of the cabinet, allowing li little bits to come through on edges. You can kind of, with your cloth, aim for the natural distressed places, like round the handle, on the top of the um, designs. This is just the first pass. We're gonna put paint over the top of this, but it means that with that half pass, you will get different layers and thicknesses of, of the um, first layer. So, lovely textures on that side. I'll take it right up here. We'll lose some of the corners along that front edge. As the gesso just about dries out, it's nearly there, I'm going to turn my attention to the final colour, which I originally thought I would go with straight duck egg, and, but I am going to mix a slightly more bluier tone. I'm going to mix two batches of colour, I think. And what you're going to need to do with your end colour is you're gonna need to actually, you're gonna need to loosen it just a fraction so it becomes thinner, more of a color wash. So I'm adding, this is Oberson, I wanted to add a little bit more blue to duck egg to make it a bit more rich. more of a grey duck egg. I think I need a little bit more. Forgive me, because I am going to dip, that's it, back in. I know I'm making a mess, guys. It's difficult with the camera right next to my head. 
Right, so we now have our colour. And that should be enough to do the whole piece. We need this to be really thin. Make sure everything's incorporated. And I'm gonna add a splash of water just to loosen it. It's a feel thing. I would say 10% water, maybe a little bit more. About 15% water. It does need to be thin. Again, I do everything by eye. A tiny, tiny bit more. And that should be enough. Yeah, that's lovely. Now I'm gonna decant a little, little bit back into this smaller bowl because I want a variant of colors. I'm just gonna make another darker version. And this is Oberson again. Just a slightly darker version, maybe a little bit more in there. That's lovely. Because I thought I might just do a few odd highlights here and there. A little, little tiny drop of water. And that can be my highlighting colour. I kind of think that's a nice French, country French colour. So as you can imagine, straight on to everywhere, including all of the details. Like I said, it's watered down enough to be able to make it really thin. Cover everything back up. doesn't want to be too thin otherwise it will pull off the under layer so it does need to be the right consistency just take your time over it and I'm using a Klingon brush because it's nice and soft um, and I'm not going to overwork the um, paintwork because if you overwork it wet paint will remove any other substrate especially with this because it's really really precarious so The gesso, once thoroughly dried, will be really grippy, like chalk paint. But at the moment, when it's wet, it becomes really unstable. And that's how we're getting all of this lovely textural um, chippiness going on. So once we apply water, I mean, you've all seen me wet distress, so you kind of know that routine, but not with the gesso. The gesso makes it pull off in a very natural way. I say gesso, this is salt wash. You know, guys, this is salt wash, but I'm using it as a gesso. But, oh, there's loads of lovely textures that it created. So salt wash is a texturizing medium, um, but today it's gonna be the gesso that we're using for this project. Trying not to overwork any area. The difficult areas are the detail. We've got to stab it in. What a lovely colour. This is a colour that I've never done before. I think my little friend has come to see us. Lily, you coming to say hello to everybody? Maybe today she will make an appearance. Oh, there you go. She's meowed, you've heard her at least. She's hungry, I think. Mr. M is in the front, pressure washing, which you may hear on the video in a little while. He said, is it okay? And I said, yeah. He's got to do his work as well as I. He 
in a minute I'm going to just go over to the other colour. Now this is just, again, it might not work out. I just had a thought of trying to add some darker tones to the detail areas. It may go terribly wrong, guys, but hey-ho. Only learn if you try. Right, I'm just going to pick up Hey, let me grab another brush. Oh, Lily. Why so noisy, Lily? <coughs> yeah, was it dinner time? Right, I'm just going to tap some Oversong into here, into some of the details. Or oh, this was the mix of Oversong. Just a little bit, only a little bit. And maybe just up here. I kind of like that randomness of the dark colours coming in. A little bit blending. No rhyme or reason, guys. I'm just going for it. Trying to do it without overworking it. Just another nuance of colour, that's all. Back to the other colour. Have to touch up the um, cocoa inside. Now time for the very best bit. It is almost the last part of the tutorial. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, spritz down the whole surface with an atomizer. It needs to be a light mist of water. I have a few things here. I've got my wet cloth and bucket, which I'm gonna squeeze out as much moisture as possible. I'm gonna be using the cloth and maybe a couple of sponges and a dry cloth as a negative to kind of remove the paint. Um, wish me luck guys, again, once again, it is a first for me with this product. So we're just gonna give it a go and see where we go. Also, what I would say, all the layers, what in between each layer that I've done, I've made sure that it's dried thoroughly as well um, with the paint. So keep that in mind every layer allowed to dry before wetting. It does seem a little bit strange to um, wet once you've dried it, but it, it will make sense. If you don't, the paint doesn't harden enough and cure to be able to peel it back. So that's, I'm gonna work in sections. I'm gonna work on the detailed area first. The reason being is that that'll give you a feel for how much is coming off. The sides are slightly different because it's one big open space. You've got to be, really gentle with that. So I've got my water and I've just wrung the cloth out. What I'm gonna do again is kind of scrunch it into a little rosette and I'm gonna just slightly start dabbing and kind of twisting. Now I can feel that there's not enough water on there to take that off, but it is 
depositing some paint. Little bits are coming. So I'm gonna allow there to be a little bit more water. Not, not too much, but just, here we go. It's starting to, I can be a little bit rough with this, I think. I'm just gonna dab on certain areas. A little bit more water. It all depends on how much, um, how thick you laid on your paint. So I can be a little bit more rough with this. Slowly, slowly, and just take off as much or as less as you like. I'm gonna work up here because I know that, there you go, there's some areas that were really naked. Oh, a nice chip there. See, that's quite natural looking. Be a bit heavier. On these corners, I know that there were naked sections in there. And as you can see, look, my cloth is loading up with paint. So we're just taking the paint off. Really natural looking chips. And don't worry about um, how stable this will be because once it's hardened and waxed, it should become really nice and stable again. So don't panic, just go for it. Allow these gorgeous little chips, here we go. As you can see, the water is obviously penetrating the chalk paint now and it's allowing it to remove that a little bit easier. There's some lovely chips. Don't overwork it, come back a little bit afterwards. The sides that I'm gonna go for, right, let's get a bit heavy with this, would you bend? Oh, there's some nice bits in the center of there. I know there was a big naked bit in the center. Look at how they fall off in proper chips, real authentic chips. The odd bit of white coming through, which is lovely as well. That's the kids next door in the garden. You've um, got Denny's pressure washing. So if you hear that, Mr. M, pressure washing. Oh, look, just lovely. And I love the colour. The colour is absolutely beautiful. Now, I've done these kind of looks with just chalk paint and it doesn't fall away in the way that this does. It's literally the gesso that's helping it. It's making a weakness underneath the chalk paint, which is helping it to fall off in these lovely chunks. Remember to stand back guys and check your balance. I'm gonna go heavy on the sides. Little bits of white there, that's lovely. See if we can get some more. Hinges would naturally wear, get heavy with them. Right, I've got to put the handle back in so I can get into the cupboard door. Because it's really tight, so I've got to clean off everything on the inside so it's nice and smooth. Take all of it off, the gesso as well, which also will give you a nice distressed edge anyway. Side. clean up the inside edge it should allow the door to go nice and freely it's nice and clean inside so I'm probably not going to paint on the inside
but I'm going to repaint the cocoa on the other side. Right, I can feel my cloth is built up with paint, so I need to offload a little bit more. I feel like I want to make something more of that area. I feel like it's good. I'm going to move around to the side. Now, flat surfaces are a little bit more tougher to work with. So um, start with your edges and work in. I'm just misting down again. It will take a few minutes for this to penetrate. The short paint. So we're going to take our cloth again. I know that there's a big area here that will come off because there's, there's um, a section of really dark stuff underneath. So I'm gonna work that. Little bit of friction, it's kind of dabbing and friction. And as the moisture starts breaking through the chalk paint, it will start revealing Nice little chips. So that's just about it guys. As you've seen, I've applied a coat of clear wax to the whole piece of furniture. The colour has gone a little bit darker and the gesso has slightly vanished, but I do believe tomorrow that will all come back to the surface once we've had a little bit of curing time and the wetness of the wax has vanished. I'm now gonna add a touch of dark wax just to a few key areas, one of which around this square aperture of the door and maybe some in the leaves. Um, also, the new marble top has got to go on. 
it's going to be attached with a little bit of glue around the edges and I'm going to pop a little screw hole underneath here and at the back to make sure that it's in place nice and firm because people will lift it up from that no doubt um, and that's about it guys Thank you for joining me. It was a long one. There was lots of little nuggets of information. I hope that you take some of this away and give it a try. It's turned out beautifully for me. If you're new here to my channel and you have enjoyed this and you wanna see some more videos from me, please don't forget to subscribe. Hit me with a question, give me a thumbs up, whatever you need to do, keep the algorithms going and uh, more people will get to see me having fun with furniture. So that's it. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye.